I have been working at Anaconda for more than four years, almost five years now. I am passionate about the open source Python ecosystem and the data science community. Uh, that's why I contributed and created some Python packages and also uh, volunteer at various non-focused PyData SciPy conferences. I also have a data science and machine learning book club. If you're interested in reading books with us, come join my book club. Um, yeah, let's get started. So in this talk, we're going to talk about why we are talking about explainable AI, um, what is explainable AI, and how do you, what kind of methods you can use to explain your black box models and what kind of tools you can use. Okay, let's, start it with, let's get started with why. First of all, being able to explain your models help you make decisions, facilitate decisions for your internal stakeholders and internal customers. Here's an example from LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has this, um, sales model where it's predicting whether a customer is likely to churn or upsell. I know a lot of companies have this kind of model. Uh, I have done a churn model before. Uh, it's very popular so and necessary. But then when a data scientist gives sales team this, res this result, okay, so this account X is likely to upsell or likely to churn, uh, the sales team's like, okay, but why, right? The sales team still need to take a lot of time and effort to dig into why this account is likely to upsell or churn to be able to talk to the customer effectively. So LinkedIn created this um, product called Crystal Candle where, um, where essentially it extracted important features uh, that's important in predicting the output, and then uh, rephrase it in a narrative that normal people can understand. So even people who don't understand data science, they understand how this model is predicted, what factors are important in predicting this account likely being upsell. So to the right here, you can see one well, of the narrative here. This account is very likely to upsell. Its likelihood is driven by those five fact factors. So with this information, the sales team is able to go to talk to the customers and tell them, okay, so because of those reasons, I think I have a perfect product for you. And then they can facilitate a, a much better effective conversation with the customers. Um, being able to explain your model not only helps your internal team, but also helps your customers. Here's an, another example with Booking.com. Uh, Booking.com is a travel agency uh, with a lot of hotels and private um, homestaying listed. It's like Airbnb, uh, but mostly for Europe, I think. So at Booking.com, each property get uh, this one, two, three, four, five star ratings, right? And then the property owners might want to know, so why is my property get rated for four stars or three stars? How can I improve my property's rating? So with, uh, with some of the explainable method, they actually used Chef. They were able to um, provide the property owners. So here are some features that may be contributing to your property. Here are the highlights. And then they also have some recommended features for uh, each property to add if they want to improve their rating. So I hope from those two concrete examples, you can see that being able to explain your model actually really helps with your internal stakeholders and your customers. And you can use the methods right now to help your sales team, your marketing, or your customers. Okay, the next important part, regulations um, and compli compliances. A lot of times, even when the models don't have race and gender in their model, um, the model is still biased because of some other variables. And we see a lot of news out there. For example, Apple Car's uh, credit assessment algorithm discriminated against women. So I think being, uh, being able to explain the model and understand how model performs will be able to catch certain biases early on before launching. 
being able to explain your model is really, really hard, as you can see later in this uh, presentation, but debugging might be even harder. <laughs> um, so here's an example. Uh, the here's an example of uh, X-ray model where we're predicting uh, diseases from patients' X-ray scan. Researchers found that they found the model performed perfectly during training and validation, but it doesn't really work in real life. So they want to know why. So researchers used in, uh, integrated gradient to highlight the pixels that contributed to the model prediction. So you can see the highlighted area uh, to the left there in the square. And then when you zoom in, you can see the model is not actually predicting diseases, but actually predicting the pen marks by the doctors. So uh, that's quite interesting, right? So now with this integrated gradient method, you are able to tell why is my model wrong? And that goes into the next one, trust. You want to know if you are able to trust your model. You want your stakeholders to sign off your model to understand your model is trustworthy before launching. Uh, here's an example using Lime where uh, we're predicting either this text uh, email message is uh, classified as asceticism or question. And you can see the words highlighted here uh, that's uh, contributing to the prediction is actually irrelevant with the classification. So this, this model is probably not that trustworthy. And then finally, very important thing is model monitoring. Uh, so the, when we, traditionally, when we monitor our model in production, we monitor model drift, uh, distribution changes, but those are really good metrics, but doesn't look into the inner work of your model necessarily. Um, you may want to check whether your feature attribution changes over time. Here's an example I got from Google uh, where you get the feature attri attribution score for each feature and you uh, plot it over time. So if the feature attribution of a certain feature changes dramatically, you will know that something must be wrong with my model. So this tells you directly why would something go wrong and which feature goes wrong. So model monitoring, very important. Um, yeah. I hope by now I have convinced you it's important to understand your model, uh, even though I feel like people are all about ChatGPT nowadays, nobody cares about explainable AI, but uh, this is still very important uh, in actually daily practice. So what is explainable AI? Uh, here is a formal definition from this book. I'll let you read it, I will not uh, uh, read it. But basically, you want to be able to describe your model's action in an explainable way that whoever is consuming the model's prediction is able to understand you, whether it's sales team, whether it's customer, whether it's marketing, whether it's product. So be able to understand your model's actions. There are a lot of uh, methods and research and schools of thoughts in this uh, field. So I'm trying. I'm going to try to um, bucket all those methods into different buckets. So help us understand different methods and also help us to get a big picture of the field. Okay. So first of all, we have model-centric methods and data-centric methods. Model-centric methods focuses on uh, the internal of the, the model, the model infrastructure, uh, the model architecture, uh, model features, and so on. Data-centric methods focus on uh, specific data points that's in your training data or from another external data set that provides some, uh, some meaning. So in the data-centric methods, we also have example-based, influence functional-based, and concept-based methods. So, uh, so you want to know what kind of change in your data could make a difference in your prediction. And concept-based method is really, really interesting. You want to know whether a concept is important in your prediction. For example, if the concept of stripe is important in classifying an image as a zebra. So that's that. Model-centric methods, we have post-hoc post methods and uh, intrinsic methods. Intrinsic methods are uh, inherently ex explainable 
uh, models, which are linear regressions, logistic regressions, decision tree, general linear models, and generalized um, additive models. So those models, you can, I mean, we, we often start with the, those models. Those are explainable. You can just use your coefficients to see uh, the model important, uh, the feature importance. And then for the post hoc methods, those are uh, methods that's observed after the model is trained. And we can further break it down into local methods, cohort, and global methods. Local methods focuses on uh, one data point at a time. So why does this predict, uh, but why, why is this instance predicted a certain way? Uh, cohort and global looks like the whole training data look at uh, one specific feature, for example, and cohort is just a subset of global. That's why they're kind of treated uh, the same. And then you can further break it down into model-specific methods. For example, uh, some of the models only working with some types of models, like TreeShap works with uh, tree... I don't know, decision tree kind of models, uh, tree-based models. Deep, uh, Deep Shap works with neural network, neural network based models. Integrated and gradient, integrated gradient works for models that can be differentiable. And model ag agnostic approach works for any type of models like kernel shap, lime. You might think this is amazing. This is what I want to use, right? But that comes with a big computation cost. So sometimes you, you need to uh, do the trade-off. And also with cohort and global methods, we also have model specific, model agnostic, and hybrid methods. Hybrid methods are basically the aggregated local um, explainable AM values that's on the left. So yeah, so here's the, the overall picture of the, the methods. And I didn't list all the methods here, just some of the representative measures, uh, methods. And, and there are a lot more <laughs> you can use. Um, I hope this is helpful. OK, so we have talked about why, we have talked about what. Now let's talk about how. I'm going to go through uh, four methods, four examples for you, uh, just provide you a basic intuition of how those methods work. You might have already fami familiar with all the methods since uh, all the methods here are pretty popular, especially Shep and Lime are very commonly used. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about tabular data with Shep, image data with integrated gradient, text data with Lime, and then most interesting and fun method that I think is uh, TCAF. Uh, note that SHAP integrated gradient and line works for all types of data, not just limited to the individual data types I'm listed here, but I'm not going to go through them uh, for the time's sake. SHAP. How many people have used SHAP? Yay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, SHAP and Shapley values are interchangeable sometimes. Uh, Shapley values is the theory uh, from game theory, and Shap is the implement, implement, implementation and also the, the library that you can calculate Shapley values. Uh, so initially, Shapley values uh, is from game theory. Imagine a, col a collaborative game. People can uh, join teams and uh, contribute to the game. Uh, we have four players. Uh, we want to calculate what is the contribution of each player to this game. So supposedly we want to calculate the contribution of uh, player one. Uh, so player one can form, uh, can form teams with uh, player two or form teams with player two or three, and player one may contribute differently depending on who, uh, which coalition uh, player one is in. So essentially the calculation is to calculate the weighted average of player one's contribution to all possible coalitions. It's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, in, the, uh, in a machine learning model case, here is a, the output or Shapley value um, from a machine learning model. Imagine we have a model. The base rate of the model, which is the output, the expected value of the output is 0.1. And now we have a, an individual, a female, that's 
65 years old, BMI is 40, and the model predictive point four for this individual. And we want to understand why is this individual's uh, prediction is point four, and how there's a difference between the base rate of point one and the predictive value for this individual of point four. So Shapley value can explain this difference. As you can see to the right here, um, the Shapley value of age is 0.4, sex is negative 0.3, BP is 0.1, and BMI is 0.1. And if you add them, the, uh, add them up together, that is 0.3. So the Shapley values of this, uh, all those features contributed to the difference between the base rate and the output. Yeah, so that's the, uh, the answer you would get from a Shapley value, and it will tell you how exactly each attribute each feature contributed to the model. There are actually a lot of algorithms to calculate Shapley values. Uh, I'm gonna go through one of them <laughs> to give you an intuition. So imagine we have a, a house prediction model. We have four features. We have the housing style, uh, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, house age. We want to understand why does this instance x1, x2, x3, x4 predicted the house price of 390K. Uh, uh, the way we do it, uh, if we want to calculate, okay, what is the contribution of the number of bathrooms here? So the step one is to sample, um, is to random sample a sample from the training data. We call it Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, and we permutate the features. Now the x parenthesis one was actually x2. Uh, and then we create two new instances. We call it x plus three and x minus three. Um, you can see the difference between those are uh, just, just the, the x3 and z3 is different. One is using the original uh, number of bathrooms from the uh, interest uh, instance. Z3 is the sample data. And then you calculate the difference between the output value of those two instances. So that's how you calculate Shapley values. OK, not yet. You still need to do this, uh, this algorithm many, many times. And then you can get the Shapley value for the number of bathrooms features. And, and again, I said there, there is. There is kernel shap, tree shap, deep shap for different purposes. Uh, I linked the shap documentation for you to take a look if you're interested. Okay, the second method I wanted to give you an intuition on is integrated gradient uh, on image data. So this is uh, one of the CNC methods. Basically, it will highlight the pixels that contribute to uh, predicting this image being a cockatoo. So you can see there are the areas near the eyes and the neck uh, and the rings uh, and wings are kind of highlighted um, in purple here. And then this is how you can, you can tell uh, which pixels are important. You can guess like which areas might be important in predicting uh, or classifying this image. As suggested from the name, this method is in, uh, gradient based. However, uh, one issue with using raw gradient is that once the model has learned um, this, this image is a cagatoo, any change in a specific pixel won't change the model prediction anymore, which means the gradient will just be zero. It will just be flat. Uh, this is also called gradient saturation in this case. So integrate gra integrated gradient solve this issue by using this uh, series of image created a straight line in image path from the baseline to the implement image. You can see here is a series of image here. Uh, so to the right here, alpha equals one is the original image. To the left, alpha equals zero is the um, base image. Uh, so you might wonder, okay, so why is the base image black here? That is a very good question. That's actually one of the limitations of this method because you have to choose uh, what kind of base image you, you want. Uh, and choosing different base image may result in different, um, different result. Uh, you can choose black or white or blur or 
completely noisy. Um, yeah, so, so that's that. And you can see the equation here. Uh, and then in practice, you're actually using Riemann sums to approximate the integrated gradient. I'm not going to go through the equations, but if you're interested, you can take a look at my slides. OK, I also linked two uh, tutorials with code from two different libraries. Um, yeah, if you're interested, go take a look. OK, the next one, Lime. How many of you have used or heard of Lime? Yay, cool. Do you like it? <laughs> uh, OK, Lime is one of the most popular methods. Uh, it's called local interpretable, interpretable model agnostic explanations. I think the reason why it's popular is because the library is super easy to use, and this method is actually really easy to understand. I think. I don't know. Um, so, OK, here we go. So the intuition on Lime is you first sample points around the original input with slight per uh, perturbations. So the original input you're interested in is this uh, big red plus in the center there. And you want to understand, OK, why is big plus uh, predicted a certain way? And then you get all those different samples around your original input. The second step is to fit a explainable linear model, which is the dashed line, on the samples. Uh, weighted by the distance to the given input in instance. That's why you can see some of the dots are bigger than the others. The big, uh, the closer it is from this original input we're interested in, uh, the bigger or the bigger weight it is. Okay, and then we can use this linear approximation to explain the local behavior of a complex model because if we're using a simple linear model, it is explainable. Uh, in the, um, in the event of pre uh, using line for text data, uh, it's, bas it's basically the same thing. So when you create new samples, you just, you just uh, randomly replace words with phrases, as you can see to the right here. Uh, and you might wonder, OK, so you mentioned you need to weight the samples by the distance. How do I calculate the distance of those uh, perturbated samples with the original sample? There are multiple ways to do that as well. Uh, cosine um, distance is a popular one. Uh, and then there are other options you can try. OK, so um, the result of using Lime looks like this that I, we have seen before, that you will just highlight the um, attributing words in your text file to see which one is important in predicting certain classes in this example. OK, I linked a Lime tutorial here again. If you're interested, we don't have time to go through it. Uh, please take a look. OK, the final method I want to mention, TCAF. How many of you have heard about TCAF? No? OK, cool. OK, this is one of my favorite methods. Uh, it's pretty cool. So when we have saliency methods, we're looking at each individual pixels and how each individual, each individual pixel contributed to the prediction. And then when you look at the whole image by itself, you're like guessing, is that area like neck? Is that area eyes? Like you're guessing what is relevant. What does the highlighted pixel mean in the saliency methods? So TCAP solved that problem by testing the concept instead of pixels directly. So for example, TCAP is using TCAP, you can test whether this concept of stripe is important in predicting this image being a zebra. Pretty amazing, right? I, I think it's amazing. OK, so here are five st steps to calculate TCAF. First of all, you need to define your concept of interest. For example, uh, the upper row of A here is a data set of Stripe images. OK, this is the main limitation of TCAF, that you need to find a database of the concept you're interested in, which could be really hard. And also, 
defining a concept that can be testable is also really hard. Like sometimes you want your concept to be specific and not too high level because you want to find the images that could work. Uh, so luckily, uh, there is a broad done data set which uh, include very uh, include a bunch of low level uh, concept images. For example, stripe. Uh, dots, zigzag, this paper actually is using the broadened data set. The next step is calculate the concept activation vectors. Uh, the way it works is that we have the stripe, uh, stripe image on the upper row of A. We also have a random image, random set of image, the lower level of A. And you pass those images to your, uh, your model. Uh, whichever layer you want to test on. Here it's using layer L. And then you train a linear classifier to separate the output between the striped image and the random image. And caveats the vector orthogonal to the classification boundary, which is the v, VCL here. OK, so the third step is to calculate the directional derivatives and which is the conceptual sensit sensitivity, which means if you change, uh, if you change this cap, how much would the output change? Which means how much, how much is the model sensitive to the change of this concept? Okay, now we can calculate T cap. I know this equation doesn't make any sense to you. Basically, you calculate the uh, directional derivatives for all your images, and among those who uh, among those images that are classified as um, zebra, how many of them has the derivative has the directional derivative greater than one, which means the stripe is making a, co a positive contribution to that image. And then those might not make sense. It's okay. Uh, step five, last step is to statistically test TCAP scores. Um, because even if your TCAV score is positive, uh, you don't know if it is significantly meaningful. So you do this process many, many times with different random images. You get a distribution of your, um, of your TCAV for your concept. And you can also get your baseline distribution by replacing your concept image with random images. So instead of having um, concept versus random, uh, train the linear model. You can do random versus random, train the linear model and get the calf. So, and then you can get a distribution of the TCAF scores for the random and random images as the baseline. And you can use t-test to test whether TCAF is significant or not. So yeah, so that's how you can calculate TCAF. Um, and then I have linked two tutorials on TCAF for you to take a look. Uh, I hope you find it as exciting as I do. <laughs> okay, next question. You may all wonder, how do we choose? There are so many different models. That is a great question. Uh, well, like <laughs> many cases, it depends. Uh, and moreover, this is a field of active research. A lot of researchers have their own opinions. Some people say don't use Lyme. Some people say use Lyme. So it's like very confusing. Uh, yeah, so I listed two references I find super important uh, and useful for me when I, when I um, try to decide on different models. So it's explainable AI for practitioners. It, this book listed a lot of more methods than the methods I have go through today. Um, yeah, for each method, it has a table of pros and cons, so you can evaluate yourself. And then uh, Captum have this algorithm comparison matrix. You can take a look. Okay, final section, tools. We all love tools. Some of you might not like math, but like if you can get your hands dirty, you can get started using it without understanding things. Um, okay, there are a lot, a lot of tools to choose from. So if you only want to use Shab Lime TCAV, uh, just use the, the corresponding libraries. Uh, those libraries are really good at specific at those specific tasks. Uh, if you want to try saliency methods like integrated gradient or many other saliency methods, you can use the saliency library. 
Uh, what I like to do is to try all the seven methods and see which methods make sense or combine them to make your own decisions. Uh, Alibi Explain has a bunch of methods you can use. Interpretable ML, I like that model. Uh, I like this uh, open source library. It has a good drop down dashboard you can, exp uh, you can explore. And also if you use PyTorch models, use Captum because Captum is designed to explain PyTorch models. And then there are a lot of vendor options. Uh, so if you're using, I don't know, Google Cloud, AWS, Snowflake, whatever, just do whatever your vendor is available to, for you to do explainable AI. If you want to learn more, uh, I listed two books that I really like. Uh, I actually chatted with the book authors uh, in my book club last month. If you're interested, take a look at the video. Uh, yeah, the authors provide very good information on different methods. And then here are my references. Thank you so much. <laughs>